this is Junaid with another uh, episode of Machine Learning in Healthcare, a Primer for Physicians. In this lecture, I'm going to discuss challenges and limitations of machine learning in healthcare. Uh, we're going to go into what the different aspects of machine learning and what their limitations are and the current challenges in this system. Um, this is the fifth lecture of the series. The first one, Prelude, I discussed that physicians need to be better stewards of healthcare. And if they do not want an EHR billing engine debacle to re-happen with machine learning, they need to educate themselves, organize themselves, and you know, uh, or share these kind of topics everywhere in the social media. Second, I came to overview about how machine learning is going to be applicable to different fields as well, including robotics, genomics, um, Internet of Things, 5G, etc. And what is the amalgamation of these technologies will change the the face of healthcare, radically change healthcare as we know it. Then I went into the technical basis, what is reinforcement learning, what is supervised learning, what is unsupervised learning, etc. Then I went into the principles where I discussed um, what are the six principles of health for proper, accurate, ethical implications of machine learning in healthcare. And now we are on the last one, which is challenges and limitations. Uh, then we're going to go into different other applications one by one. I'm going to go with clinical studies that are applicable to acute ischemic stroke, cerebral hemorrhage, aneurysm. And then I'm going to move to maybe palliative care or uh, predicting mortality, readmissions, etc. This is divided into three big topics, um, data and algorithm related, which is the most important, then legal and regulatory related, and then empathy and trust related. So these are the challenges that we think are going to be important from a data related. The first challenge is data loss. Um, there's tremendous amount of data that is being completed in the healthcare on a live basis that is never recorded. Um, there are two problems with it. Number one, uh, we should make it a priority. And then secondly, what really will change is that that with the loss of that data, we are actually decreasing the predictive, predictive power of the algorithms. So tons of data being, being collected may not be stored and if stored cannot be used. So if the data is not interoperable with the EHR, then who gives a damn? Same thing, uh, things are changing and improving, but at the end of the day, there's a significant amount of data loss that we have to work on. Signal strength in data. So this basically goes towards that the data we're collecting is unlabeled and it is not available for rapid uh, execution of prediction. Uh, you can have massive amounts of the data and you can use deep reinforcement learning to make some sense out of it. But if you have, if you want quality data, you have to increase the signal and decrease the noise, which is basically more discrete labeled data to be available. And if not, you can just use that particular set that is labeled. And it, Probably sometimes you need about 20% of it, uh, not all of it. And this can actually significantly improve your prediction power. Again, noise in data, you have to remove it. Um, and this can be actually easily solved with, with the end user. For example, if, if I'm writing a note, if I can just have a drop down menu saying lacuna infarct, um, less than two millimeters, it is on the right, left, etc. And then these things can, can, can be the ground truth. And once you have the ground truth, then you have decreased the noise. Um, another problem is that why am I the data clerk? Um, and the way to again to collect this is not, if I see 100 stroke patients, don't ask me to do it on all 100 of them, do it on 20 of them, and then train the rest of the model to fix the other 80%. The most crucial issue in our time is gonna be data ownership. And I've talked to this about before, we really need to, as physicians, advocate for data ownership by patients, for, for our patients and for ourselves. If the data ownership is becomes a, is not properly implemented, we're gonna be in big trouble. And that ownership can only belong to the patient itself, not the healthcare organization, not the physician, not anyone else, but to the patient. Data privacy, I'll talk about cybersecurity and breaches in a minute. There's clearly some biases in the data and then the bias in the data is very significant. There will be some examples. Explainability, again, we have machine learning algorithms, but I, the biggest issue for me to trust them in the first place is, is it something that is gonna 
change the way uh, how did you collect it how what are your limitations uh, nobody publishes it if you look at the studies again the bigger issue is proprietary ship of the machine algorithm every company comes out with it but nobody wants to disclose their proprietary algorithm and this ends up becoming another the same problem is why how am i going to be able to trust you if i don't know and this is not um, amazon trying to sell more uh, lamps on the website this is real big problems for the patients we're talking about brain bleeds pneumonias tbs etc so i really if i need to trust you the the there should be a method for uh, maintaining their proprietorship i think that's very important uh, intellectual pro rights are truly important to produce continued progress more progress in this field however there should be a middle line where i can actually have enough information to to know by myself not by a publication uh, of, or advertisement what the limitations are uh, at the very bottom in the fine print but truly experience what the limitations would be and this this whole thing can become a fish circle when applied on machine learning um if you have small things that you can control and you can think about it and if you're not getting the answer you can actually change it when it, when, it, when it applies into a massive system, it has an exponential power to increase it. I'll show you an example. So first and foremost, big data. How do you define big data? Um, we'll come to that in a minute. 30% of the world's stored data is generated by the healthcare industry. McKinsey says that just that data is worth $300 billion. So there's a real incentive to put data into a silos, not to interoperability, not to share it. And this is a big challenge. And if you remove that ownership of the data, this becomes a completely different story. So big data has to have some characteristics. Number one is availability. I mean, it should be accessible and in a timely fashion. I mean, you, if you have the data, as I said, people have stored probably, you know, billions of bits of data, but if it's not available in an accessible, in a timely fashion, who gives a care crap? It has to be usable. Um, that means that there's enough credibility and accuracy of the data. And if you don't have the data that is discrete, uh, that has that is devoid of redundancies, um, then it, it, the data is useless. Uh, again, same thing with the reliability. That you know the data format has to be clear and then has to be consistent. It has to be relevant. I mean, if the if the data you're getting is uh, is about um, pulmonary function test um, and you're looking at a patient with um, cardiac STEMIs, then who gives a crap as well? So there should be available, usable, reliable, relevant data. And then the most important thing, it could be presented in a way that actually can make wisdom out of it. Um, this is another way that I have guidelines on. Please review it. The second biggest issue is data accuracy. Now this this is gonna this blew my mind when I when I read it. This is a New York Times article, and please do read the whole darn thing. It is extremely important. It goes into India, and there there's a town in India which is famous for labeling work. And then um, a female was interviewed, and she actually told us that she got quote unquote ten hours of training from a GI gastroenterologist specialist who was a retired person. Um, and taught her what are the polyps in a colonoscopy, what is this, etc. And then, then she was given thousands of videos that she looks through the colonoscopy and clicks on, on all these things that she thinks are abnormal. Ten hours of training it is was used um, for this. It's uh, it's kind of ridiculous, um, but if you really look at it again, the data accuracy issue comes into a big problem. I agree, if they're gonna pay board certified GI specialists to do it, um, that would be much more expensive, but why not? Because once you have the label data, then you are actually in a very positive way and you can just continue to make money on that one algorithm and it's gonna improve by itself as well because more and more people are gonna do it. And then if you input into it uh, active learning process, so. Let's say I have 10,000 colonoscopies trained with algorithm and I'm using it. And if I see a new polyp that the algorithm didn't recognize, I can just point to it and say, this is something that you missed. And then it's gonna be better the next time. 
but this is this is interesting um, that um, and this is makes me the most worried about machine learning application in healthcare and the companies that are trying to do it and how they're trying to do it. And the biggest problem is, again, if you're going to do software as a medical device, you don't have any. Uh, the, the companies that are employing this have no reason to invest more unless FDA makes them invest more. And then secondly, they have no liability on it. Again, all, the, all of these things fall uh, towards the physician. This is an article by uh, Mr. Huston in, from Google. And then he's talking more about like Amazon mechanical trunk, etc. And, you know, there are, again, multiple images, databases that have been created. Uh, and then people are labeling data on it. Um, for example, you can have 16,000 items. Uh, you just put it over a mechanical trunk and then um, the, the person is supposed to, to label it. That labeling is, is kind of... It, problematic because there's no quality control on it. They are prob they, they are actually worried about this on freaking differentiating between a couch and a chair. And then we are, as medical professionals, need to be way more careful about this. Bias. Bias is a big issue. Let's start with uh, general applications. And uh, so this is a quote from Bill Gates. The first rule of any technology used in business is that automation applied to efficient operation will magnify the efficiency. The second, that, op that automation applied to an inefficient operation will magnify the inefficiency, which is so true, especially in the era of machine learning. If the machine learning mi missed one polyp on the colonoscopy, uh, that's not one polyp. If that machine learning is potentially applied to 6,000 practices around the United States and being used on 600,000 patients. And if it is applied correctly, all of those patients will benefit. And if incorrectly, there will be huge misses. And that's where I'm very worried about the quality of data. When you do have data, the other big issue with the data is bias. One of the biggest studies we have is like farming and heart study, um, big, big, massive amount of data. But who, who, what, what does that data belong to? It basically is, is Anglo-Saxon, Caucasian, you know, races. And this particular data, the predictions we're going to come from it, are not going to apply in all situations, races, etc. So there's an inbuilt bias of selection in, in data. This will also very much exacerbate the health disparities. And there's a recent example for it. Um, the other big issue is the measurement bias. It's this phenometer that is made by one company and the other has, again, no correlation. Um, same with the gyroscopes, etc. So there's a significant amount of measurement biases that can happen and how to account for that. Two examples. Um, the one on the uh, face recognition software is great, only for white men. So if you look at it, it was actually... The whole article, you're going to see that um, even high-end NBA players were mistook for um, for people who are in prison. Very bad situation. Only applies to black and women uh, as far as the bias is concerned. Similarly, a court system was established to see who should be released on bail. And then it, it un unjustly actually took African-Americans uh, and prejudiced against it. A, 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 a freaking AI algorithm was prejudiced against uh, African-American population not to release them on bails. And, and the reason is not that. The reason is because the data you have fed them is coming from that situation and you do not have enough variety in the data to actually be able to make come up to a judgment. Um, those are the two big examples that data cause bias. Um, the gender bias. Very interesting. If you actually write this, he is a nurse and she is a doctor and translated into Hungarian. But if you reverse translate it, you, it's going to come up as she is a nurse and he is a doctor. There's a significant amount of biases, even at Google Translate um, options. So gender bias continues to be a problem. This is one of uh, truly remarkable unfortunate bias in our, in our healthcare system and society in general, and that 
a healthcare algorithm affecting millions in biased in biased against black patients. The issue was that that they tried to have a prediction model of the cost. And then when they looked at the cost of the healthcare and who are the biggest reasons, they were able to die, you know, see that African Americans were considered more costly. And therefore the algorithm was recommending to even treat less severe white people as compared to more severe black people. And the reason behind that was that that the cost matrix was done. Again, it can be easily fixed. Uh, it's not that big a deal to fix this, but again, please do look at it um, in more detail. Interoperability and information blocking. Interoperability means that one system talks to the another in a standard machine format. Information blocking means that, that since I have this information, I don't want to give it to this. And since I don't want to give it to this, uh, I'm basically blocking the information. This is the key challenge of machine learning implementation right now as we speak. And the minute we're going to solve this is going to make huge changes for both patients, physicians, etc. There are technical challenges, which I'm going to talk about. Sem uh, semantic challenges, again, how you're going to define this. And then organizational challenges uh, going through this interoperability. This is truly one of the pieces of legislature that I'm proud to be <laughs> say that I'm an American. This is the 21st Century Cures Act, um, complex legislation, but with simple goals. Number one goal is uh, define exceptions to the definition of information blocking. So now it presumes that any medical information company, EHRs, etc., are going to be sharing data, period. And if they're not going to share data, they can be um, have regulatory consequences of it. For example, um, they are able to um, make um, certifications on EHR from a, from a government level. And if they do not share and actively engage in interoperability, they can lose their certification. If they lose their certification, then basically nobody's going to buy it. So that's one way. So, and then they actually identified exceptions to it. So in, in short, there are very few exceptions. You have to prove it that why it is an exception, then and only then you can block. Otherwise, the, the standard presumption is you're going to share that data, period. Adopt application pro programming languages, APIs. Um, not only that you have to share the data, you have to make it easy to share the data. You have to have APIs built in and available publicly so people can chime in in those APIs and start uh, building uh, applications for your software and also able to grab data from it or transmit data into it. Have a strong uh, focus on patients' access to healthcare. This has been really missing. Uh, I've talked about it uh, before, and I'm gonna come talk to it about it in a later, but this really hones in that patients need to have access, period, and you can never block it at the end of the day. And not only do you have to block it, you have to give it to them in a manner that is usable. So again, Fantastic piece, piece of legislation. Increase innovation and competition by applying all of the above. So this is the uh, Office of the National Coordinator, ONC, who actually pushed about all these technologies about uh, healthcare, information, and inter interoperability. We are stuck in data silos. And uh, if you go through this, these are the different people who have actually advocated for it including American Health Information Management, et cetera. And their main thing was that um, before regulations are finalized, a uh, sufficient level of industry review. So there are people who really don't want to like this um, legislation. Surprise, surprise. And uh, what are the real, and then they went into different points um, of how this is going to be implemented and how hard will it be for them. Um, I think they gave a two-year time frame for all this. The biggest thing that they did was HL7, which is Health Language 7, and FHIR, um, Fast Interoperability Platform. Um, and they were able to um, standardize the definitions. They were able to um, see what where the, the generation of the topics will be. And FHIR has become uh, the main operability, interoperability engine 
uh, that healthcare industry is going to use. Azure uh, Health um, Cloud Data Provider has a Fire API built in for it so that it can collect data in an appropriate fashion and, of course, um, reproduce data when it is needed. Um, Epic, uh, which is one of the, I think, the largest or the second largest, depending where Cerner and Epic are, um, we call it large and largest and everything. But at the end of the day, Cerner and Epic together only control 39% of the industry, which is pathetic um, as compared to Coca-Cola and Pepsi, Boeing and Airbus. There's no, they're nowhere near um, the level of uh, market uh, that we would think. They also release US core data for inter interoperability. That is basically an API that is generated on Fire platform. Data security, we keep hearing this. Um, ransomware, we're thinking about victims of the ransom attacks. We have significant amount of problems in data security. Uh, and these are just examples. I'm going to show it up to you. You can read it uh, in your free time. But it's like if there's not a single day passes by when you have a data breach somewhere, medical or non-medical. And this is also very important. Like why? This is a study that uh, was published as NEGM. Identification of anonymous MRI research participants with face recognition software. Um, MRI, let's say I had an MRI and then clearly I have multiple um, pictures online of mine on Facebook, Google, etc. And what they were able to extract from the MRI, the facial features, and then were able to identify who that member is. Massive implications. Let, let's, for some re reason, I got the study done and uh, there was a plaque that was written. I don't know. Uh, nobody potentially probably notified me. And at the end of the day, they notified me. I went and got another test. Everything was fine. But what if that that thing was shared with my insurer and my rates would go from $1,000 a month to $10,000 a month? It has some very real ramifications. And again, uh, there's no real security. Uh, and I don't care about the security in a way that they were able to identify me. The issue becomes is that even if they were able to identify me, were they going to be able to change my insurance rates or not? So that's where the key pieces of legislation are missing. Data ownership, boy, this is interesting. So 29 states have no law that identifies specific ownership. They just don't. Great. I mean, who needs the laws uh, to protect information, right? Um, there's only one state, which is in green, that says that the total ownership of the data, clinical data, belongs to the patient. The others either don't have it or they don't specify it. As a matter of fact, 28 of them, um, sorry, give me one second. I think 20, uh, the 21 states, uh, they have officially say that the data belongs to either the physician practice or the healthcare organization. Uh, out of this world. I mean, I don't know, from a legislative perspective, they actually own the data. I, I don't believe that in any way shape. Fortunately, CMS is doing the right thing. CMS actually published this blue button, again has an API, and then developers can play in the sandbox and they can actually uh, be able to get CMS data directly to you in different ways and formats. But CMS has produced an API already do that. I talked about this in the first lecture, which is prelude, why doctors should organize. And I think the most crucial reason for clinicians, not just doctors, to organize is for health data ownership should belong to patients. And I, I, I have no way to put that into actual nonprofit organization, um, but um, keep spreading it. At least someone will contact me and we can work on it together. Now, the, the last most importantly, and it's not the last, but it is very important, is explainability. AI is like a black box. You have the input, you know what the input is, you know the output. What will happen in the middle is, is a complete mystery. And uh, if it was something else, identify cats and dogs, yeah. So this is the biggest challenge. Why is it a challenge? That's the key thing to understand. The The issue becomes is that, that historically there has been a trade-off between inter, inter 
interpretable machine learning models and performance. The more you try to make it in a way that you you in, you want it more in, interpretable, unfortunately, you have to decrease the performance uh, of the model because they don't have to go on each layer and explain what they did and then go to the next layer and explain what they did, etc. So at the end of the day, it is and it is precision medicine and it's, it, uh, NNT um, is going to be one. So at the end of the day, this is becomes a big issue uh, and you will decrease the performance both in terms of accuracy and time to result a lot. Uh, and that's where the trade-off comes in. And in certain situations, trade-off is fine. I mean, if you're doing cost predictions, length of stay, uh, ED arrivals, you know, that's fine. Um, and you can forego the, the interpretation, interpretability of the algorithm. But if you're diagnosing IC a score of four uh, versus five and, you know, et cetera, and you're thinking about end of life issues, you darn needs to be able to explain it. And that's where the crux of the matter is. Life or death algorithms are avoiding the black box of AI and medicine. And that's what I said, especially in palliative care and other, other self-fulfilling that we now consider self-fulfilling uh, prophecies. And hopefully AI can change that is to be able to explain them. Um, and it's not just medicine, to be honest with you, uh, legal, finance, military, all these places where there's a high impact, um, we, should, we should be able to say, why do you do it this way? Why, why not something else? Why did you, when did you succeed? When did you fail? When can I trust you? How do I correct an error if you found one? So all these things need to be open. Um, and if that doesn't happen, that is one of the biggest change challenges of healthcare and machine learning. We need AI that's explainable, and here's the kicker word, auditable and transparent. Now let's move from data, and we talked about data silos, data ownership, um, algorithms, etc. And now we come to the legal challenges. Um, I touched upon them, um, sort of when I was explaining them. Uh, who's responsible for care, who's accountable for harm, what if the medical insurance company can get a hand of these kind of things and going to change. Um, prior authorizations are going to be different because is this a pre-existing condition that Junaid Kalia had uh, because his wife bumped his head into the table by doing these hobbies. <laughs> so all these things are important. Um, and of course, the FDA approval process. We talked about CIDACE, uh, a com uh, computer assisted personalized sedation system um, would have to be pulled onto market because of multiple limitations. I talked about it in the last lecture. Again, same thing, liability. How are you going to be, who's really liable? Because if the AI is correct and the physician does not take the action, if AI is incorrect and AI physician does take the action, and what happens to the patient outcome? important chart, important study, please review. We should be advocating for, for liability and who's truly liable and how much physicians are liable. We talked about this in the last lecture as well. FDA needs to really tighten the regulation. And to be honest with you, um, after the opiate crisis, it's unbelievable that FDA, first of all, let it happen and then let, let it happen for so long. It's ridiculous. Um, I mean, we were talking about 30, approaching 30,000 deaths per year. FDA didn't do anything. I'm, I'm not gonna let physicians out of the mark either. Physicians didn't do anything either. Both of them are responsible. But this, another thing is that it, it basically puts a big lot of worry on my head that if AI is implemented as out of the shelf, you know, box implementations of things, we, we could see a significant amount of trouble up ahead. And rather than, you know, mislabeling a dog and a cat, um, we will have real lives on the line. We talked about in the last study as well, I just wanted to repeat, repeat that, that uh, less than 1% of studies are accurate, truly defined in a way that a study should be conducted. What is a training set? What is a, a test set? Was the same amount of training in the test set, uh, training set was given to the physicians? Was it different? Was it externally validated? These things need to be explored. And then some of these studies, uh, you know, need to be redone or um, are just unpublished because um, 
we all want to get published, but at the end of the day, there is a significant amount of responsibility on us that these studies that come out are of higher quality. Uh, so if there's the 14 studies in which the same training data set was used between the ML and the, and the healthcare professional, what they found was actually they were similarly accurate. They were not more accurate, which is the hype. And that's what really um, discomforts me is how this hype is publicized. Again, we cannot reproduce it. Can we ever do a meta-analysis? Because we don't know what, what line, on the line 22 of the code, it is not an S and an X, and does it mean that it's a completely different algorithm, etc. So there should be a way that a meta-analysis meta should be possible. And this is a, an excellent article. Precision of evidence needs evidence of precision. <laughs> We really need true evidence base to practice precision medicine. All the things I told about are sort of summarized in this article published in New England Journal of Medicine. And we are at the cross, crossroads. Um, early efforts, AI sucked. Now we are literally in the current state where, as I said, if you look at a, a good study, you would see that the AI is equivalent to the radiologist or any other health professional. But it will definitely get improved because at certain point in time, AI has the ability to constantly improve and more data, recent data will, will make a difference. And as a matter of fact, we can start tuning our CT scans and MRIs uh, eventually that the machine learning uh, can pick them up faster, sooner, et cetera, too. So we are at a crossroads and we need to make sure that we take the right path. And the last one is, I talked about trust a lot throughout, and then empathy. Ah, anyway, um, it is so subjective that it cannot be truly, in my opinion, studied. Uh, but why not? Why not create artificial empathy? <laughs> empathy. Um, I'm not going to go into too much. Any 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 practitioner clinician knows how important it is, and uh, this is one limitation that I think no way I can overcome, but people will keep trying. So the next lecture series is gonna be about applications in neurovascular disorders, acute systemic stroke, cerebral hemorrhage, aneurysm and subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, and that will one by one go into each applications and then we'll talk about them more. Again, thank you so much for listening. Uh, please visit my website, provide me with feedback, subscribe to my YouTube channel, and for God's sakes, share. Thank you.